Hello everyone and welcome to Midweek Bible Study published on Wednesday the 10th of June, uh, the Wednesday after Trinity Sunday. And my plan for the next four Wednesdays is to look with you at the letter of Paul to the Philippians. It's one of his prison letters. So I've come to the place where we keep our chains. Uh, these aren't chains. These aren't chains for uh, people, but it's a chain we use sometimes to cordon off the car park when we need to keep it just for our own use. Uh, we keep it uh, in the hall, so I've come to the hall, an opportunity to sit under the cross in the entrance part of the hall, and also to have this wonderful statement from Christ on our banner, which at this time we have proudly sat in our window, uh, which is also the door for the hall. So, in the hall, with the chains, the words from Christ, that he is the way, the truth and the life, and the cross. What does it mean to be restricted? Do Christians respond the same way as non-Christians? What priorities do we have in lockdown? Have we, in some sense, lost the joy of being happy captives of Christ, if I may use that expression? It's going to take us, I think, four Wednesdays to work through Paul's letter to the Philippians, the church at Philippi, a Roman colony in ancient Greece within the Roman Empire. I'm going to name these studies Letters in Lockdown, because according to chapter 1, verse 13, Paul says he is in chains for Christ. And as he writes, he reflects on four perspectives. First, looking back. As Paul picked up his quill and parchments, no doubt he recalled that he had been in chains before in Philippi. In fact, one of the first converts was the jailer who looked after him, the others being the jailer's family, a slave girl from whom an evil spirit had been driven out, and a businesswoman called Lydia. The story's in Acts 16. That church, male and female, slave and free, Jew and Gentile, was a wonderful expression of the breaking down of Jewish prejudices and also the walls around the tem temple in Jerusalem no longer symbolising those who were excluded. And Paul says in chapter 1, verse 6, that I am confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on until the day of Christ Jesus. For that to happen, he issues a prayer with seven remarkable phrases. So I'm now in verses 9, 10 and 11. He prays for growth that love may abound, for understanding in knowledge and depth of insight, for vision so that you will be able to discern what is best, for holiness to make us pure and blameless until the day of Christ, for maturity filled with the fruit of righteousness, with a faithful focus through Jesus Christ and for faithful worship to the glory and praise of God. That's a brilliant prayer as Paul looks back at the church he established and then he looks round. Even in lockdown Paul is active. His other prison epistles are indicated by words such as I am an ambassador in chains, Ephesians 6 20. Remember my chains, Colossians 4:18. Onesiphorus was not ashamed of my chains, 2 Timothy 1.16. Epaphras, my fellow prisoner, Philemon 23. And now in Philippians 1, he issues three reports. Number one is from himself. He says, through me, every sentry detail, probably four soldiers at a time, have been told about Jesus. It's become clear through the whole palace guard and to everyone else 
that I am in chains for Christ. Through his supporters, that's report number two coming in from the outside, explanations has been given as to why Paul is now doing time. <clears throat> and we find in verse 14, most of the brothers in the Lord have been encouraged to speak the word of God more courageously and fearlessly. Remarkable. Some, but you might have been forgiven to thinking most, would have thought, well, if they arrested Paul, they're coming for me next. But no, they're just bolder than ever. And then there is the report of the critics as they take the opportunity to show they can do ministry just as well as Apostle Paul. Thank you very much. And it seems as though, verse 15, some preach out of envy and rivalry. And Paul says, do you know the great thing? They may suppose they can stir up trouble for me through selfish ambition, but whether from false motives or true, verse 9, uh, 18, Christ is preached and that's the main thing. Even though, of course, souls will be hurt when it's fully discovered the true hearts of these rival missionaries. Paul has looked back and now he looks around. And then he looks forward. He's deeply honest about the tensions he feels within his soul. Paul himself feels deeply, both for Christ and for people. To be apart from those he brought to Christ leaves him with a deep sense of painful separation. Verse 8, God can testify how I long for all of you with the affection of Christ Jesus. At the same time, he also longs to be with his Lord and away from the constant troubles and tests and trials. Verse 23, I desire to be, depart and be with Christ, which is better by far. But of course, he has to believe that, doesn't he, if he's a man of credibility. Any Christian minister must say, look, my heart is with Christ, that's my security, that's my goal, my job is to take as many people with me on the way. God has not made it known to Paul what lies ahead, so he resolves simply in verse 20, these are magnificent words, that Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. Christ is his pattern. Living, it's for God. Dying, it's for God. So he says in verse 21, to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Of course it is. To go to a place with no more tears or pain or crying or mourning. And if he's preserved, however, he knows the agenda. It's fruitful labour. I love that. That's what I'm here for. Labour that's fruitful. He's looking forward. And the fourth look is looking ahead. Looking ahead, meaning just to the immediate future for the people he knows. So how should Paul finish this opening chapter? He could become bitter, couldn't he? You know, God has let me down. He could start to complain, no one comes to see me anymore. He could become self-justifying. I've had a hard life. I've got every right to be fed up. Instead, just like his Lord Jesus on the way to the cross, stopping to give time and full attention to a beggar, Paul continues to think of blessing others regardless of his own suffering. Here is a man so Christ-like. How deeply proud we are to have an apostle like Paul. Being locked up does not destroy Paul's standing, but actually enhances his credibility, because it's clear how he uses his time. He urges the believers, verse 27, to stand firm in one spirit. And verse 28, not being frightened in any way by those who oppose you. That calmness in the face of attack shows your enemies that they're on the wrong side of truth and the wrong side of history. And it's a sign to them that they will be destroyed, but you will be saved and that by God, verse 28. You see, even our conduct when others run us down is a powerful evangelistic tool, a signal of God's grace and a gospel invitation. What does that mean for you and me? I'm going to draw out three things. Number one, the gospel itself. Did you notice the five references to the gospel? Five references in one chapter. Verse six, Paul thanks God for their partnership with him in the gospel. Verse seven, 
My life is given to defending and confirming the gospel. Verse 12, even my jailbird status has really served to advance the gospel. That's the talk of the town where I'm here. Verse 27, conduct yourself in a manner worthy of the gospel. And uh, verse 27 also, I'm delighted you're contending as one man for the faith of the gospel. How precious gospel unity is. Paul, you see, is a gospel man, a messenger of good news. First gospel, second application, joy. Four references to joy. Paul says, verse 4, he prays with joy. Verse 18, sharing Christ. All that of others are doing means I rejoice. Verse 25, encouraged by your joy in the faith, as it's reported to me. And verse 26, you know, a reunion between us will simply bring joy in Christ Jesus. The gospel thrills his heart, just as then as ever. Jailed or free. Third application is resilience. I hear a lot of people talking about resilience today. Such an important characteristic. Paul explains the full privilege of loving Christ, verse 29. It has not been, it has been granted to you on behalf of Christ, not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for him. To believe on him, we're resting on him, we're leaning on him, and that will include a measure of suffering. Just as Jesus said, take up your cross and follow me. Just as Jesus' example was Calvary and then resurrection. We are to endure suffering for him. The gospel, joy and resilience flowing out of this letter as Paul looks back, looks around, looks forward and also in the short term with people looks ahead. Paul's letter from lockdown shows that he lived for Christ whatever the circumstances. I wonder is that also true of us? Let's pray. Gracious God and loving Heavenly Father, we thank you for this letter from lockdown. We thank you for the example and the passion of the Apostle Paul. And we pray, Heavenly Father, that what motivated him would motivate us, because with his help we see Jesus clearer. Bless us all at this time of being apart until we finally can come back together for your name's sake. Amen. Just been thinking of that hymn, fight the good fight with all thy might. Christ is thy strength and Christ thy right. Lay hold of him and it shall be thy joy and strength eternally. Thank you for joining me this time.